Hi, my name is Dr. Paul Sachs, and thank you for joining us today as I review first day treatment, definition, and review of the data. So this is a 32-year-old uh, man who was recently seen in our practice. He was initially seen by his primary physician with several weeks of fever, poor appetite, new skin rash, and difficulty swallowing. He also reported a 10 kilogram weight loss over the last several months. Uh, he had a past history of herpes zoster four years ago, but unfortunately had not been HIV tested at that time. That was a real missed opportunity. Uh, he moved from Thailand to the United States four years ago. Uh, he lives with his male partner and he does report no prior HIV tests. On examination, he was chronically ill appearing with a temperature of 38.6 uh, Celsius oral thrush and several um, numular skin lesions that look like psoriasis. So this is the way he looked when he was in our uh, outpatient clinic. So we had oral thrush and then these psoriatic plaques scattered around his skin. So um, the laboratory tests available for us that day were as follows. His white count was low at uh, 3,100. His kidney function was normal. His liver tests were normal except for an elevated alkaline phosphatase and his HIV screen was positive. Uh, his HIV viral load, his CD4 cell count, his hepatitis serologies, and his HIV resistance genotype were all sent, uh, and we did not have those results. So the question for consideration here right now is, uh, would, when would we start him on HIV treatment? Obviously, he has advanced HIV disease and needs therapy. And then the second question is, uh, what would you start? So, there is experience with uh, so-called rapid start in the United States. Uh, this is a program that began in San Francisco that they call rapid, which is basically same day art initiation, including the uh, seeing an HIV provider, getting labs done and counseling, and then boom, go ahead and start the antiretroviral therapy. What they've been able to do is show that over time with this program, they've been able to get people more rapidly virologically suppressed. The initial goal was to do this both for the health of the individual and to reduce the spread of virus to others. So when you look at this uh, Kaplan-Meier curves, so the figure right here, these are historical controls. And you can see that the fastest time to viral suppression is indeed in this people who have the uh, rapid start. So that's compared to a universal art guidelines, which were adapted by uh, San Francisco in the early 2010s, and then the history of the CD4 guided art. Of course, that's ancient history at this point. So one important thing to mention about this rapid start program, and here's some follow-up, is that this is a very difficult to treat patient population that includes a high proportion of individuals who have underlying psychiatric disease or substance use disorder, and also a large proportion of individuals with in, inconsistent housing. Nonetheless, uh, they've been able to achieve very high rates of virologic success. Uh, over 95% have at least one HIV RNA less than 200. And this is sustained years later. Uh, and this is undoubtedly due to an increased use of integrase-based regimens. The other thing that's very interesting is that they have not had to have substantial changes based on any of the baseline laboratory tests that have not been back yet when they initiate antiretroviral therapy. I'm gonna mention now uh, a, uh, a meta-analysis that looks at randomized trials of initiating ART right away and compares them to standard of care. Now, most of these studies were done in resource limited settings, but I think they have some applicability to those of us treating patients in uh, developed countries as well. What the uh, figure shows is that overall, uh, the rapid start group is associated with an increased likelihood of art initiation, certainly, retention and care, certainly, and also viral suppression, as well as a decreased likelihood of loss to follow-up, and at least in some studies, a decreased uh, risk of dying, which is really very, very impressive. I remember the first time I saw these data, they came from Haiti, uh, that they actually had to stop the study early. It was rapid start versus standard of care, and the rapid start arm actually had improved survival. There's also data that starting right away reduces the size of the HIV reservoir in individuals, and this is potentially very useful if you imagine in the future when we have curative interventions for HIV. Undoubtedly, those, of the, uh, those who have a lower HIV reservoir will um, 
will be uh, more amenable to HIV cure strategies. So what this has done is this has led to a, an alteration in the guidelines for when to start antiretroviral therapy. So it's emerging as the strategy of choice to reduce loss to follow-up and to decrease time to viral suppression. In the Department of Health and Human Services guidelines, they say it's recommended at the time of diagnosis when possible or soon after. Uh, they do acknowledge that it's resource intensive and that the observational and that the data supporting this in the United States, at least, come from observational studies, not randomized studies. WHO says something similar. Art is recommended for all people with HIV, including same day, if the patient is ready to start. Now, the International Antiviral Society USA has just recently updated its guidelines, hot off the presses, and they report, they state, start antiretroviral therapy as soon as possible, including immediately after diagnosis if the patient is ready. And I just want to put a call out to our uh, published guidelines. Uh, it has sort of a funny name. It says international, uh, and it also says USA. I think that's because most of the people on this panel are from the United States, but it does include some representatives from Europe as well. So uh, what do specifically we say in these guidelines? Initiate ART as soon as possible after diagnosis, including immediately, rapid or same day start if the patient is ready. Remove any structural barriers that delay antiretroviral therapy in particular, at least in our country, it would be insurance coverage, but it may be different for some, uh, some other uh, in places. Um, in the setting of starting active opportunistic infection treatment, perhaps, one should delay a bit. Now it says within two weeks for most opportunistic infections with some exceptions. Uh, tuberculosis within two to eight weeks. Remember there are important drug interactions with tuberculosis in particular with rifamycins. And then the data are probably strongest for delaying with active cryptococcal meningitis. You'll recall from our case that our patient did not have any symptoms consistent with cryptococcal meningitis, but as we all know, there are occasionally cases where people are asymptomatic, and I think a baseline cryptococcal antigen makes sense when people with advanced HIV disease are diagnosed. So what information must you have before starting antiretroviral therapy? Well, the patient has to be ready to start. Uh, on examination, they don't have any evidence of active cryptococcal meningitis that may warrant a short delay or any other AIDS conditions that really, really require therapy before ART can be started. It also makes sense to counsel on medication adherence, although what we have found, and I'm sure you've experienced the same thing, is that medication adherence counseling, uh, most of the time, uh, does not need to be very lengthy. People understand the benefits of antiretroviral therapy, and usually they're very eager to get started. You don't need to convince them. So what's not needed, CD4 cell count, HIV viral load, HIV genotype, resistance test results, hepatitis results, HLA B57-1 status, STI screening results, and pregnancy results. None of these is really required prior to starting antiretroviral therapy, although they all, all are potentially uh, very good to know. Many of them are, are really critical to know what the baseline is, but not for starting ART. So uh, what are the specific regimens in our guidelines? Well, they, have, uh, they share certain characteristics. Looking at DHHS guidelines, they say use a bictegravir or dolutegravir containing regimen along with tenofovir uh, FTC as its uh, nucleoside combination. They also include the darunavir cobacistat or darunavir ritonavir boosted regimen. And what these regimens all have in common is that they have high resistance barriers and that transmitted resistance is extremely unusual. Uh, you'll note that the, both the DHHS and the ISUSA guidelines cite NNRTI transmitted resistance as a reason not to use NNRTI-based regimens for initial or rapid ART. The ISUSA recommendations are more streamlined, and they recommend either a Bictegravir or a Dolutegravir-based initial regimen, and Darunavir-based regimens are considered as alternatives. And we do have some prospective data on rapid start. Now, with all the uh, caveats that these uh, rapid start studies are, have some of the artificiality of being studies. And the first of these that we received um, was the DIAMOND study. And it looks at single pill darunavir cobacistat FTC TAF for rapid art initiation. It included 109 participants. It was a single arm study. Everybody got the same regimen. And the really inclusion criteria only were basically that people were over 18 and diagnosed with HIV within the last two weeks. Primary endpoint was at week 48. 
uh, and uh, interesting to look at the baseline characteristics. Um, it was a predominantly male population, mean age, median age of 28. Uh, it was racially diverse. Um, how advanced disease did they have? 25% had a viral load greater than 100,000 and 21% had a CD4 cell count less than 200. Fascinating always to look at transmitted drug resistance. What's been true in the United States and I believe Europe for some time right now is transmitted protease inhibitor resistance, transmitted tenofovir resistance and transmitted integrase inhibitor resistance are exceedingly rare. Did not happen in anyone in this uh, study. There was one patient, so that's less than 1% who had uh, transmitted uh, FTC resistance, so M184V. But Look at this, 28% had transmitted NNRTI resistance. That's actually much higher than I expected. Actually, that's 28 out of 109. Oh, and then if we look at the, I'm sorry, if we look at the results, you can see that overall is a highly successful inter intervention. Looking at the FDA snapshot, which counts loss to follow-up as failures or discontinuations for other reasons as failures, out uh, at week uh, 48, you had about 79% who were virologically suppressed, but the observed, meaning the on-treatment success rate, was 96%, which is really excellent. And there was nobody in this study uh, who had um, developed a significant, who developed resistance. Uh, there's another study that just came out that uh, was called the STAT study, and here it's dolutegavir lamivudine. Remember, this is not recommended for uh, people who, uh, for rapid start in any of the guidelines. So really the investigators here wanted to test the hypothesis that they could do this safely with this two drug regimen. So before people uh, had baseline assessments with hep B genotype, it's viral load CD4, they were um, able to start dolutegavir lamivudine. Uh, and, and by uh, week 24, there were a bunch of people who either had to adjust their treatment or they had to discontinue. And the reasons for art adjustment were uh, what you'd expect. Um, so some people had baseline hepatitis B, uh, and so they had to discontinue, because remember, you need to use tenofovir for initial regimens in hepatitis B. Some had transmitted M184V, actually only one did, uh, and some just decided they did not want to participate. But overall, most were able to continue. And the results are shown here. Again, uh, the uh, on-treatment success rate was very high, 87%. Uh, 74% using the, the uh, FDA snapshot analysis. Um, overall, uh, uh, continued. A, this is considered a successful study because really there was nobody who developed uh, resistance-associated mutations. And also I should mention that baseline, I, I, I should have mentioned this in the previous, the previous slide, the baseline significant fraction of these uh, participants had viral loads greater than 100,000 um, and some had viral loads greater than 500,000, which as you recall, was an exclusion criteria from the dolutegavir lamivudine gemini studies. So which brings us to an observational study from a Chicago-based uh, HIV practice, looking at people in role, engaging in care from a, a, a little less than a year, um, from January 2018 to March 2019, 241 with rapid start, getting started within 14 days of diagnosis. Median start for them was 3.1 days, a high proportion started Bictegravir FTC TAF, which has become a very common default regimen for rapid start in our country. Um, and then there were some who delayed treatment a bit, and even among those, about 85% uh, Bictegravir FTC TAF. And you'll see the baseline characteristics of the people in this study um, in, the, uh, in the table. So here are the results. Um, Overall, 90% uh, of the people who had rapid start and were on Bictegravir FTC TAF had successful treatment, and 90% who had delayed treatment. And the median time from the date of diagnosis to the time of viral suppression was only 60 days for the rapid start, and it was 95 days for the delayed start. So this has led to a, uh, a, a prospective study called BHAST, clever. Uh, which is looking at uh, Bictegravir FTC TAF um, in same-day treatment evaluations. It's a randomized study where people are going to be randomized to start right away without a lot of baseline information or to do a standard of care. It's 50 in each study arm. Uh, this is registered in clinicaltrials.gov. And I think that one could say this is highly likely to be successful since, as we know, Bictegravir is one of those regimens with a high resistance barrier and uh, encouragingly, um, a very little transmitted resistance. So um, just some things to worry about the risks of rapid ART. 
You don't want to miss someone who has underlying TB or cryptococcal disease. Bictegravir is not a good drug for people with tuberculosis because of the rifamycin bictegravir interaction. Obviously, severe renal or kidney disease might warrant some changes or need to be stabilized. Um, there is a small risk that people might feel coerced into taking ART if you force them to start ART on the first day. But what have I know, I've observed that most people are eager to start on the first day. And then there are issues about women of childbearing potential. You may want to discuss this in further detail with them. But overall, I would say starting ART uh, really does have many advantages, increases the likelihood of linkage. Um, it's safe. It's well tolerated. Our regimens are so good now. It leads to faster viral suppression and may reduce the risk of transmission to others, reduce the, the, reduce the risk of loss to follow up, um, improve retention, improve viral suppression. And that generally, we do recommend for these rapid starts, high resistance barrier regimens, second generation integrase inhibitors, Bictegravir and Dolutegravir, or Darunavir. Um, we don't have a lot of data yet on people with PrEP failures, but good news is we don't have anybody who's developed integrase or Darunavir resistance with this strategy so far. So let me just wrap up by telling you what happened with our case. Uh, he was started on Bictegravir FTC TAF, one pill daily, counseled about medication adherence. He was very adherent. He also received fluconazole for oral thrush, uh, trimethoprim sulfa for pneumocystis prophylaxis, and topical steroids for his psoriasis. His baseline labs showed, not surprisingly, he had advanced HIV-related immunosuppression with a CD4 cell count of 10, a viral load of 180,000, no transmitted drug resistance, and no evidence of chronic Hep B. Um, he has tolerated the regimen well, and as we often see with integrase-based regimens, he achieved viral suppression very rapidly. So with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention uh, and show you a beautiful picture of Boston in the autumn. Uh, I hope you can come visit again soon once the pandemic is over. Thanks so much.